After the pandemic, China witnessed a dramatic shift in its tourism landscape. In the first quarter of this year, Chinese travel agencies accommodated only 52,000 inbound international tourists, marking a staggering 99% drop from the 3.7 million visitors in the first quarter of 2019 before the outbreak. Of these 52,000 tourists, half were from Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan. Tour groups from Europe and America have almost vanished. A Wall Street Journal report on August 3rd said, quote, "As interactions between China and Western countries decrease, the narrative of long-term decoupling will become more pronounced." On August 6th, Fan Wenxin, a journalist from the Wall Street Journal, reported in another article that half a year after Beijing abandoned its zero case policy and reopened its borders, this decline symbolizes the growing distance between China and the West, potentially leading to long-term negative repercussions. In May, Xiao Qianhui, the president of the Smart Tourism branch of the semi-official China Tourism Association, said during a lecture that the number of visitors from Europe, the U.S., Japan, and South Korea had plummeted. The absence of overseas visitors is particularly evident in major cities like Beijing and Shanghai. In the first half of this year, the number of foreign visitors in these cities was less than a quarter of comparable figures before the 2019 outbreak. Taking the tourist hotspot Zhangjiajie in central China as an example, Zhangjiajie National Park, the filming location of *The Floating Mountains* in the movie *Avatar*, used to be a favorite among foreigners. However, from January to mid-May this year, only 25,600 overseas visitors arrived, a 95% drop from the 500,000 foreign tourists in the first five months of 2019. Compared to other countries, five markets saw a recovery in the first half of 2023 that exceeded 2019 levels, with growth rates of 338%. 236%, 117%, 108.4%, and 107.4%, respectively. The U.S. and Australia were close to their 2019 figures, growing by 95% and 92%. Moreover, markets in South Korea, the U.K., Germany, and France showed strong recoveries. The number of international flights arriving in China has been limited, preventing Chinese airlines from returning to their pre-pandemic service levels. However, both Chinese and international tourism experts believe that worsening relations between China and the West have made foreign tourists more cautious about visiting the country. At the end of June, the U.S. State Department issued a Level Three travel advisory warning U.S. citizens to reconsider traveling to China due to concerns over quote arbitrary enforcement of laws, which includes potential exit bans and wrongful detentions. Matt Kelly, a business consultant from Boston, fondly recalls a bicycle trip he took in Guilin 15 years ago. Located in southern China, Guilin is characterized by its picturesque hills and scenic beauty. While Kelly has visited China twice since, he expressed no interest in returning in the current climate. Quote, "Do I yearn for the familiar China of the past? Absolutely." But now China portrays itself as being against the West and anti-America, and this deeply troubles me," remarked Kelly. In the past, Pennsylvania-based Friendly Planet Travel would annually arrange trips to China for around 1,500 clients. Its founder and president, Peggy Goldman, shared that since the pandemic, they haven't received a single application to tour China due to the significant ill will towards the country. Although Goldman believes China will regain its popularity in time, the company has not relaunched its Chinese tour packages yet. Data from Mondi, a travel tech firm in Austin, Texas, suggests that in the first half of 2023, the number of travelers from North America to China was only 40% of that in the corresponding period of 2019. Mondi sells China tour packages through travel agencies and other intermediaries. In 2019, approximately 500,000 travelers flew from North America to China, accounting for about 20% of all air travel from North America to China that year. Dan Harris, founder of the Harris Bricken Law Firm, which provides consultancy services to U.S. businesses operating abroad, stated that while corporate executives still inquire about business trips to China, many are now focused on the risks involved. Previously, the primary concern was about expediting visa processes. 
Harris emphasized that, quote, companies are deeply concerned about unforeseen incidents affecting their employees in China, and the average American is naturally even more concerned about their own safety. Unless absolutely necessary, Americans are reluctant to travel to China. In the past, Harris frequently traveled to Beijing for work and enjoyed stays in Qingdao, indulging in its beer and seafood. However, after his recent public criticism of the Chinese Communist Party, he no longer visits China. The dwindling interest in China isn't exclusive to individuals from mainstream Western countries. Even foreigners who have lived in China for many years are starting to depart. These expatriates once served as bridges between Chinese society and their home countries, often inviting their families and friends to visit. 37 year old investment consultant Alexander Sirikov moved back to his native Bulgaria from Shanghai in August 2022. He observed that the majority of his expatriate friends had also left, including eight of the ten expatriate families in his residential compound. Quote, people now perceive China as very distant and somewhat aloof, Alexander stated. Shanghai has long been the headquarters for most foreign companies. Before 2022, a quarter of China's expatriate population resided in Shanghai. According to census data released in 2021, approximately 164,000 foreigners lived in Shanghai, working across various sectors including technology, finance, and education. However, from late March 2022, a stringent two-month lockdown resulted in a significant exodus from Shanghai. In June, a video circulated on Chinese social media platforms showing a Chinese man standing on a deserted Fuxing Road in Shanghai. He gestured towards the empty buildings on either side of the street, commenting on how a mass exodus of expatriate managers from Fortune 500 companies had caused a sharp decline in rents for luxury residences in the area. Quote, Yongkang Road used to be bustling with foreigners, completely filled. Now, not a single foreigner can be seen, only Chinese. All the foreigners have left, he lamented. A decline in international tourists may also signal a drop in foreign investment in China. Analysis of official data by research firm Rongding Group reveals that in the first quarter of 2023, foreign direct investment, FDI, in China plummeted to $20 billion, a stark contrast to the $100 billion seen in the first quarter of 2022. Mark Witzke, a researcher from Rongding Group, corroborated this decline, noting that FDI inflow into China during the first quarter had drastically decreased by 80% to $20 billion from the previous year's $100 billion in the same period. Amidst the steep decline in foreign investments and inbound visitors, China's economy continues to slump. The housing market is in freefall, youth employment rates are hitting historic highs, and the number of Chinese optimistic about their income and job prospects is dwindling. The second quarter saw virtually no growth in the Chinese economy compared to the first. As the Chinese economy regresses, its ideological opposition to mainstream Western countries becomes more pronounced. The newly revised anti-espionage law, effective from June 1st this year, does not specify what content falls under the category of national security or interest for the Chinese Communist Party. It allows authorities to access data, electronic devices, and personal property information during anti-espionage investigations and could potentially impose exit bans. On July 31st, the Chinese Ministry of State Security released an article on WeChat emphasizing the importance of the, quote, mass participation of citizens in the effective implementation of the anti-espionage law. It called for nationwide vigilance, encouraging mutual surveillance and reporting. This implies that overseas Chinese returning to China could be reported based on their comments or actions. On August 3rd, the Cyberspace Administration of China released a draft of the, quote, Personal Information Protection Compliance Audit Measures. These new measures mandate stricter oversight on data flowing overseas, particularly emphasizing a review of key information infrastructure operators and those handling personal data of over a million individuals. Any data transfers outside the country must undergo a security evaluation organized by the National Cyberspace Department. For foreigners, these myriad security regulations from the CCP are viewed with suspicion and discomfort. 
On August 8th, in an interview with Voice of America, Professor Fan Shiping of the Department of East Asian Studies at Taiwan Normal University commented, quote, China has never truly been a country governed by the rule of law. They often talk the talk without walking the walk. This is why some sarcastically say that the CCP's constitution is the world's best, as it superficially emphasizes respect for freedom of belief, speech, and publication. On the surface, they seem to champion every imaginable freedom, yet in reality, they fail to implement any of them. The measures by the Cyberspace Administration are merely a facade, purporting that Chinese officials care about the legal processing of personal data, when in fact it's just a means to extend surveillance over the populace. Fan Shiping stated, quote, The Cyberspace Administration of China is now seemingly omnipresent. Their definition of foreign is overly broad, encompassing foreign media, journalists, and enterprises. Essentially, anyone foreign is considered overseas. Under an exaggerated emphasis on national security, the best way to build relationships with foreigners in China is to have no relationship or contact at all. The anti espionage law is a case in point. It broadens the definition of espionage activities, prohibits the transfer of any information that could be deemed related to national security, and grants authorities the power to impose exit bans and investigate anyone suspected of espionage. This has left foreign nationals in China feeling increasingly vulnerable. This is quite unbecoming of a great power. Su Ziyuan, a senior analyst at the Defense and Security Research Institute funded by the Taiwanese government, remarked that the expanded anti espionage law will ultimately backfire on the Chinese government. Quote, the CCP is becoming increasingly isolated on the international stage, and coupled with a sluggish domestic economic environment, its leadership is keen on attracting more foreign investment to aid China's economic recovery. However, the expansion of the anti espionage law directly harms international corporations. Denton's, one of the largest Western law firms in China, is currently divesting its operations in the country. In a statement on August 8th, Denton's announced the move was in response to, quote, recent requirements from the Chinese government, including those related to cybersecurity and data protection. This decision by Denton's comes at a time when the CCP government is expanding its cybersecurity and data protection laws, further souring the prospects for foreign firms in China. In fact, even before the vaguely worded anti espionage law came into effect, foreign companies operating in China were already under increased scrutiny. In March, Chinese authorities detained five local employees of the New York based corporate intelligence firm Mints and closed its Beijing office. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs accused the firm of, quote, illegal business operations. Later, authorities conducted a surprise search of Kaizen Consulting's office and interrogated employees of management consultant company Bain and Company. In late March, China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs said that a worker from the Japanese pharmaceutical firm Astellas Pharma was detained for allegedly engaging in, quote, espionage activities that violated criminal and anti espionage laws. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida vowed to continuously urge the Beijing regime to release its citizen. Meanwhile, Chinese living abroad are increasingly reluctant to return home. An NBC News report on July 28th highlighted a Chinese American from Shanghai who used to visit his family and friends in Shanghai every two years. However, post pandemic, the situation changed. With recent advisories from the U.S. State Department against traveling to China, combined with the unexplained detention of some foreigners in China, he's re evaluating his travel plans. He expressed, quote, Much has changed since the pandemic, especially with the lockdown measures in Shanghai and the shifting political landscape. Unless it's a family emergency, I'll likely avoid going back to Shanghai. He further expressed his concerns quote, I fear returning to China, where officials can arbitrarily harass you and you might be denied the right to leave. I'm not saying I would definitely face harassment, but the possibility exists. This is particularly worrying, especially when my family is there. For this unnamed Chinese American individual, all of this suggests an uncertain future. 
Quote, tell China's story well and convey China's voice effectively was a propaganda slogan introduced by Xi Jinping a decade ago. In his report at the 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China last October, Xi reiterated the need to accelerate the development of a uniquely Chinese discourse and narrative, to effectively share China's stories and voice, and to present an image of China that is trustworthy, endearing, and respectable. Beyond Xi Jinping, the slogan has been echoed by many senior CCP officials. In May of this year, the newly appointed Chinese ambassador to the U.S., Xie Feng, released an open letter stating that the current Sino-U.S. relationships faces significant challenges. He expressed hope that students with their ability to bridge both Chinese and Western cultures could effectively convey China's story and convey a genuine picture of China to their American peers. Jie Li Jian, a Chinese international student in the U.S., told the media, quote, Many international students recognize that telling China's story well essentially means crafting an enormous lie for the CCP on the world stage, painting a rosy picture of its authoritarian regime. The CCP's strategy of blurring the lines between the party and the people, creating confusion and conflating the party with the nation, is utterly shameful. Professor David Shambao from Georgetown University estimated in 2017 that China spends about $10 billion annually on its, quote, storytelling efforts. Sarah Cook, a senior researcher at the nonprofit organization Freedom House, noted that from 2017 to 2022, China's efforts to shape media content and global discourse dramatically expanded, impacting various regions and languages. She estimated in 2020 that China was spending several hundred million dollars annually on overseas storytelling. By 2022, Freedom House's estimate surged to tens of billions of dollars. Xi Jinping's governance logic is peculiar, filled with inconsistencies and deep contradictions. On one hand, the new version of the anti-espionage law broadens the definition of espionage-related activities, insinuating that foreigners entering China or those with foreign ties are potential spies. This seems to be a deliberate attempt to foster hostility towards foreigners and nurture xenophobic sentiments among the populace. On the other hand, various departments and institutions of the CCP have invested significant resources over the years to tell China's story well. Regardless of the tactics the CCP employs for its propaganda outreach, it's challenging to alter the inherent nature of the party, which is rooted in deceit and aggression. Naturally, achieving the desired propaganda outcomes becomes elusive. The Tell China's Story Well campaign introduced by Xi Jinping in 2013 seems, a decade later, to be yet another unfinished project. The aggressive promotion and explanation of his Chinese dream similarly turned out to be an illusory goal.